Thanks, Wick. Although people may believe that slavery is something from the history books, many people are trafficked into slavery today, even in our own country. SALT's human trafficking focus group, Shattering Shackles, will now gi give you personal testimonies of people forced into these horrible situations. 15-year-old Debbie is the middle child in a close-knit Air Force family from suburban Phoenix and a straight-A student, the last person most of us would expect to be forced into the seamy world of sex trafficking. But Debbie, which is not her real name, is one of the thousands of young American girls who authorities say have been abducted or lured from their normal lives and made into sex slaves. While many Americans have heard of human trafficking in other parts of the world, few people know what happens here in the United States. The FBI estimates that well over 100,000 children and young women are trafficked in America today. They range in age from 9 to 19, with the average age being 11. And many victims are no longer just runaways or kids who've been abandoned. Many of them are from what would be considered good families who are lured or coerced by clever predators who are particularly adept at reading vulnerabilities. And these predators are going where the kids are. What you can see time and time again is that the predators will adapt their means to whatever the young people are doing. Whether it's malls, ski slopes, beaches, predators are going to do everything in their power to try to convince young girls, young boys to come with them and to enter this particular lifestyle. Debbie's story is particularly chilling. One evening, Debbie said she got a call from a casual friend, Bianca, who asked to stop by Debbie's house. Wearing a pair of Spongebob pajamas, Debbie went outside to meet Bianca, who drove up in a Cadillac with two older men. After a few minutes of visiting, Bianca said they were going to leave. So I went out, out and I started to give her a hug, Debbie told Primetime, and that's when she pushed me into the car. As they sped away from her house, Debbie said that one of the men told Bianca to tie her up and said that he would threaten to shoot Bianca if she didn't comply. She tied up my hands first, and then she put the tape over my mouth and eyes, Debbie said. While she was putting tape on me, one of the guys told me if I screamed or acted stupid, he'd shoot me. So I just stayed quiet. Unbelievably, police say Debbie was kidnapped from her own driveway with her mother right inside. Debbie said her captors drove her around the streets of Phoenix for hours. Exhausted and confused, she was finally taken to an apartment 25 miles from her home. She said one of her captors put a gun to her head. He goes, if I was to shoot you right now, where would you want to be shot? In your head, in your back, or in your chest? Debbie said, and then I heard him start messing with the gun. And he counted to three, and then he pulled the trigger. And then I was still alive. I opened my eyes, and I just saw him laughing. Debbie said she was then drugged by her captors, and other men were brought into the room where she was gang raped. And then, that's when I heard them say, there was a middle-aged guy in the living room that wanted to take advantage of a 15-year-old girl. She said, and then he goes, bend her over, I want to see what I'm working with. And that's when he started to rape me. And I, I see more guys. Four other guys had come into the room, and they all had a turn. It was really scary. After the horrifying gang rape, police say Debbie was trapped in one of Phoenix's roughest neighborhoods. In a rundown, garbage-strewn apartment, her captors were trying to break her down. They were asking me if I was hungry, she said. I told them no. That's when they put a dog biscuit in my mouth, trying to get me to eat it. After a sleepless night, Debbie was tossed back into the car and again driven around Phoenix. She said they talked to her about prostitution and that one of the men forced her to have sex with him in the car and then later in a park. The same man took her back to his apartment and Debbie ended up in a dog kennel. Greg Scheffer, the officer with the Phoenix Police Department, said Debbie was kept in a small dog crate for several days. Lying on her back in the tiny space, her whole body went numb. She was subjected to various abuses while in there, Schaefer said. And this is all part of the breaking down period, where he tries to gain complete control of the girl. Schaefer said Debbie was forced to have sex with at least 50 men, and that's not counting the men who gang raped her, on a periodic basis. Debbie had no idea who the men were. Most of them were married, with kids, and I asked every single one of them why they were coming to me. If they had a wife at home, they didn't have an answer. For more than 40 days, police say Debbie remained captive, often beaten and forced daily to have sex with a, of the most degrading kind. During that time, she said she did not try to escape because her captors had done what police ha had seen so many pimps do, threatened her and terrified her. Debbie said that the pimps told her they were to go after her family and even threatened to throw battery acid on her 19th month old niece. After they told me that, I didn't care what happened to me as long as my family stayed alive, she said. And that's pretty much what I had in my head, staying there to keep my family alive.
For Debbie, the chances of getting out alive seemed slim, but then police investigating the case heard tips that she was being kept in an apartment in the Phoenix area. Police searched the apartment but didn't find Debbie, but they were, were still suspicious. So police broke down the doors to the same apartment and realized with a shock why they'd been unable to find Debbie. She was there, but she was tied up and crushed into a drawer under a bed. Debbie said she heard Officer James Perry calling her name, but was too frightened to answer. I didn't know what to say. I was just lying under the bed, stiff as a board, shaking, she said. And then he opens the middle drawer and he was shocked. Debbie gave him what she called the biggest hug in the world. While it seems unbelievable that these girls didn't try to escape earlier, experts say it's not so uncommon. These are human beings who are owned by someone else, who lack the ability to walk away, who lack the ability to make a decision of their own self-interest, to do something else, said Albert. If that's not slavery, I don't know what is. Police arrested two people at the apartment, and Debbie was taken to a safe house for children while her mother was called. Debbie has been joyfully reunited with her family, but they have put their house up for sale. They've decided to leave Arizona and move to the Midwest, where Debbie hopes she can find some innocence that she lost one grim night in September. If you've been affected at all by this and are looking for ways to help, there are two important things that you can do. The first, if you suspect any kind of exploitation, any kind of slavery, call the national hotline. It's 888-3737-888. Any sort of tip or information could be vital to saving someone's life. The second is more general, but equally as important. If you want to advocate for change, visit Polaris Project. They have a website, www.polarisproject.org, and you can find up-to-date information on the legislation that's pending. All you have to do is contact your officials. Make your voice heard for those people who can't make their own. Thanks, guys. One focus group studying rape victims of war asks, where's the outrage? Tonight, they will be sharing with us how this topic has per been portrayed in the news lately. I'm Michael Dobler. I'm Jen Van Swall. And I'm Kristen Horman. For this past semester, we were part of a SALT focus group dedicated to raising awareness about the devastation of the use of rape as a tool of war in Central Africa. We'd like to share a little bit with you now about this situation and the current relief efforts. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, or DRC, is a country in Central Africa which is roughly half the size of the United States. The sheer size of the region, coupled with the instability of the Congolese government, poses a set of problems that are difficult to surmount. The situation in the Congo largely began with the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. This disaster was the result of ethnic tension that had been present since the Belgian occupation of Congo in the 20th century. Prior to the Belgian occupation, the two major Rwandan ethnic groups, called the Tutsis and the Hutus, shared many cultural ties. However, the Tutsi group, despite being the smaller of the two, was given control through land ownership. In 1994, a widespread ethnic cleansing campaign initiated by the Hutus resulted in the indiscriminate murder of over 800,000 Tutsis. Fear of retaliation by Tutsi forces in neighboring Tanzania and Uganda led many Hutu refugees to flee to the DRC. This influx of well-armed combatants, along with the instability of the Congolese government, led to further persecution of Tutsis living in the Congo. A common tactic that has been employed during this conflict is the rape of civilian women in the villages located in the contested regions of the DRC. Many of the rape victims are exposed to the HIV virus, while many others become pregnant as a result of the attacks. Also, some women are abused by having their genitals mutilated. The public way in which women are raped tears apart the social fabric of these villages. Some men cannot bring themselves to embrace women that have been violated in such a disgraceful way, and for this reason, some women are ostracized. The unstable environment caused by this inability to embrace victimized women allows Hutu terrorists to better assert their power and provides another incentive for the combatants to continue using rape as a tool of war. Another way the established Hutu forces are able to maintain their control is through exporting valuable resources from the area and exchanging them for weapons. Because these groups control the wealth, villagers and civilians have no access to weapons and are defenseless against the armed soldiers. The UN has initiated a mission in the DRC that is designed to protect these defenseless civilians. However, while the UN action is the largest and most expensive in the world, it is not enough to completely resolve the conflict. People in Africa still live in constant fear of attacks from rebel groups. 
Thousands of civilians are displaced due to the conflict and find refuge in UN camps. In these camps, UN forces and other organizations are working to provide medical care and psychological counseling for rape victims. Women for Women International is one such organization that provides financial and emotional support for women survivors of war in order to help them achieve ownership of their own labor, inputs, and profits. These organizations help to reintegrate women into their communities by giving them an education and the resources they need to become successful and respected members of their societies. The fundamental problem in the Congo is a lack of political unity and stability. The Congolese justice system is unable to adequately prosecute people responsible for war crimes, such as rape, murder, destroying villages, and creating child soldiers. The few crimes that have been put to trial were not presented in a civilian court, so the victims had no opportunity to defend themselves or hold their own government accountable. One way to aid in the relief efforts is through microfinance. Microfinance is the supply of loans, savings, and other basic financial services to the poor. It is based on the idea that low-income individuals are capable of lifting themselves out of poverty if given access to financial services. These low-income individuals are given a small loan that is enough money to suit their needs, but not so much that is difficult for them to repay. Microfinance promotes gender equality and household harmony by supporting women's economic participation. Many women who are victims of rape due to war go on to start their own businesses to provide an income for themselves and their families. These empowered women possess their own assets, such as land and housing, and play a stranger role in household decision making. In some programs that have been active for many years, there are even reports of declining levels of violence against women. Only through continued efforts such as these can victims escape the inhumane situation in the DRC.